Hello and welcome to Creation Club channel. My name is Michael and in this video we are discussing design in nature. This is a term that is actually thrown around quite a bit and often it's used to discuss the uh, the complexity that we see in design almost from an engineering standpoint. Here we have the definition of design as purpose planning or intention that exists or is thought to exist behind an action, fact, or material object as in the appearance of design in the universe. So when we see complex interworkings like this, uh, we're often referred to as design. For, for example, in the, in the cellular machines that we see on a, a very small biological scale, for exact Linus Pauling, the Nobel Prize winner in chemistry, once said that just one living cell in the human body is more complex than New York City. This is a fact that is staggering for us to wrap our minds around it sometimes uh, because of the, the very, very small microscopic scale of the cells and then understanding that there's so much rich complexity there uh, with biological machines and things. And this is something that I wanted to briefly explore uh, just a little bit further in the following video. I remember the first time I, I looked in a biochemistry textbook and I saw a drawing of something called a bacterial flagellum with all of its parts and all of its glory. It's had a propeller and the hook region and the, the drive shaft and the motor and, and so on. I looked at that and I said, that's an outboard motor. That, that's designed, you know, that's no chance assemblage of, of parts. Behe's reaction was not surprising, for the molecular motors that drive bacteria through liquid each depend upon a system of intricately arranged mechanical parts. These parts come into focus when portions of a cell are magnified 50,000 times. Biochemists have used electron micrographs like this one to identify the parts and three-dimensional structure of the flagellar motor. In the process, they have revealed a marvel of engineering on a miniaturized scale. Howard Berg at Harvard has labeled it the most efficient machine in the universe. These machines, some of them have, are running at 100,000 RPMs and are hardwired into a signal transduction or sensory mechanism so that it's getting feedback from the environment. And even though they're spinning that fast, they can stop on a dime. It only takes a quarter turn for them to stop and shift directions and start spinning 100,000 RPM in the other direction. And just like outboard motors on motorboats, it has a large number of parts which are necessary for the motor to work. The bacterial flagellum, two gears, forward and reverse, water-cooled, proton motive force, it has a stator, it has a rotor, it has a U-joint, it has a drive shaft, it has a propeller, and they function um, as these parts of machines. It's, you know, it's not convenient that we give them these names. That's truly their function. Since its discovery, scientists have tried to understand how a rotary motor could have arisen through natural selection. As yet, they have failed to offer any detailed Darwinian explanation. To see why, we must understand a feature of molecular machines known as irreducible complexity. Irreducible complexity was coined by Mike Behe in describing these molecular machines. Basically what it says is that you have multi-component parts to any given organelle or system in a cell, all of which are necessary for function. That is, if you remove one part, you lose function of that system. The idea of irreducible complexity can be illustrated by a familiar non-biological machine, a mouse trap. The trap is composed of five basic pieces, a catch to hold the bait, a strong spring, a thin bent rod called the hammer, a holding bar to secure the hammer in place, and a platform upon which the entire system is mounted. If any one of these parts is missing or defective, the mechanism will not work. All components of this irreducibly complex system must be present simultaneously for the machine to perform its function. 
catching mice. Irreducible complexity also applies to biological machines, including the bacterial flagellar motor. All told, there are about 40 different protein parts which are necessary for this machine to work. And if any of those parts are missing, uh, then either you get a flagellum that doesn't work because it's missing the hook or it's missing the drive shaft or whatever, or it doesn't even get built within the cell. In evolutionary terms, you have to be able to explain how you can build this system gradually when there's no function until you have all those parts in place. So what we have with the irreducible complexity is an idea that becomes very difficult to explain away through regular Darwinian evolutionary uh, ideas and concepts. Uh, here an article says Michael Behe asserts that the complicated biological structures in a cell exhibit the exact same irreducible complexity that we see in the mousetrap example. In other words, they are all or nothing. Either everything is there and it works, or something is missing and it doesn't work. Such a system cannot be constructed in a gradual manner. It simply won't work until all the components are present and Darwinianism has no mechanism for adding all the components at once. And so the idea of slow change, slow gradual incremental change uh, adding up to this uh, kind of machine, this kind of biological cellular machine, just doesn't make sense. I mean, again, the bacteria flagellum has over 40 different protein parts, which all must work together in harmony and are required for this unimaginably small outboard motor to propel the bacteria through the cellular fluid. And again, if any of these parts were missing, the entire biological machine would lose all function. And, and the scale that we're dealing with, the, the microscopic scale, is sometimes difficult for us to fully appreciate. For example, the width of the, the cell membrane in which this uh, outboard motor, motor is seated is only 4 nanometers uh, wide. And that's a term that is uh, easy to toss around and sometimes hard to comprehend. So I want to watch one more short video just to help, help us understand exactly how small a nanometer actually is. Let's make the almost inconceivable nano world conceivable. The naked eye can see the diameter of a human hair. That's one-tenth of a millimeter. Or 100,000 nanometers. To understand the small, we're going to scale it up to skyscraper proportions. And return to our human hair and blow it up to the size of the Empire State Building. A typical human cell, say a red blood cell, would rise to the 10th floor. A bacteria cell, the third floor. Working down our scale, a run-of-the-mill protein molecule would be the same height as a small dog, about a foot and a half and a nanometer, on our Empire State scale, it's less than a quarter of an inch. That's about the size of five microscopic atoms placed end to end. So it's safe to assume that when we see an outboard motor, we understand that that would have to be designed by an intelligence uh, and not simply arising by itself through chance and, and random circumstance. However, when we see an outboard motor that is on a scale that small, I see no other way around the, the reasoning that it is clearly a product of design. However, I want to look at design in this video from a slightly different standpoint. I want to look at it uh, as an artistic endeavor. Uh, definitions here to plan and fashion artistically or skillfully, to plan and fashion the form and structure of an object, work of art, uh, or the organization or structure of formal elements in a work of art or composition, because our God is not only an infinitely wise engineer, but he is also a stunningly accomplished artist. And I want to consider some of the artistry that he has 
uh, infused into the things that he has made, specifically some of the animals that he has created. And I want to start with one that might seem odd, the peppered moth. This is often an animal that is used to uh, explain evolutionary thinking. It uh, has been a long icon of evolution because the story goes that the peppered moth uh, has gotten its black and white coloring because of a uh, smog that was being pumped into the atmosphere uh, at the onset of the industrial revolution and these moths gradually adapted to the 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 uh, soot and and smog that was being absorbed onto the surface of trees and it allowed them to camouflage themselves and the moths that did not adapt and form this unique coloring that allowed them to to match the the uh, bark were then eaten by birds because they were clearly the white moths clearly stood out against the dark tree trunks and you will often see this on on websites and it was in textbooks for a long time the problem with this is that the uh, the evidence, as evolutionary evidence often is, was tampered with because those moths were literally uh, glued to the trees, dead moths being glued to the trees to show how the white moths clearly stood out against the darkened tree trunks. And the problem is that these moths never uh, find themselves out on the sides of tree trunks. They would always they often will uh, land on the underside of branches much further up uh, in the tree trunks to keep themselves hidden. But the peppered moth and other animals like these, I think, are incredibly exciting evidence for the existence of God because they exhibit design in an absolutely indisputable fashion. And by design, I mean artistic design in which the patterns, the intricate patterns, uh, the white and black spotting of their leaves and how it allows them to camouflage so beautifully into the tree trunk is clearly an act of, of design from an artistic perspective. And we see a number of, of animals like this, countless examples of animals like this speckled sand dab. Uh, and these are evidence for God when we acknowledge the design in these animals from that artistic or an aesthetic standpoint, that is how they look. So not even from an engineering standpoint, but just looking at how these animals integrate and blend into their surroundings becomes a beautiful example of design from, uh, from a different perspective. Uh, for example, the great horned owl uh, and how its patterning on its leaves allows it to uh, become so stealthfully hidden uh, amongst the trees. And again, animals like these and countless others that employ mimicry or camouflage beautifully exhibit this artistic uh, ideology of design. And the way in which animals like this perfectly match colors, they perfectly match textures, shapes, the patterns that we see, these cannot be accounted for from a naturalistic standpoint. That is to say that these things couldn't just have happened by coincidence. And we inherently understand and know that. When we look at this leaf-tailed gecko and how fantastically similar the patterning and coloring uh, and texturing on his body is and how remarkably similar it is to the the leaves and things around it we just understand in our gut that this is a product of design and we see so many uh, examples of this i mean there's there's absolutely no debating that if there is a reason for these creatures to look the way they do and obviously that that is survival by being camouflaged they're less likely to be eaten uh, and so there is a reason and if there is a reason for something to be the way that that it is then there is also a purpose to them just like there is purpose for these leaf litter toads to be colored and textured and patterned in such a way that they easily blend into the leaf scattered grounds of the tropical rainforests uh, in which they are found. 
there's a purpose to that and purpose is an interesting thing because purpose does not and could not simply arise from undirected random natural processes if something is truly random if something is in fact being guided without any intelligence behind it then there is never going to be purpose involved in that because purpose is a product of intelligence just like we see here in all of these examples there is an inherent intentionality in having one object look like another and this is amplified this becomes even more apparent when those objects are living organisms that grow and change over their lifespan for example just like this spinnered bark uh, these long spinnered bark spiders that look so much like the tree trunks upon which they they await their prey often when you trace backwards and think that that spider began from a, a very small egg and the tree began as a seed and both of those have uh, dramatic developmental changes that they have to uh, work through and then end up at a final product which allows the spider to be camouflaged on the tree trunk there's a purpose to that there's an end goal in mind that could not have been developed by random chance and circumstance and so uh, this becomes i think just an incredible uh, example of a creator god the god of the bible yahweh having been intricately involved in the production of all these wondrous plants just like it records uh, in Genesis because it takes skill and intelligence to know how to elegantly shape a form a three-dimensional form to resemble another pre-existing object uh, if this is just all random natural selection an unguided process how is an unguided process going to know what a leaf looks like so that it can direct random chemical mutations to create an animal that looks exactly like a leaf no you have to be able to see something to know what it looks like so that then you can shape a form to look just like that it takes skill and intelligence to match the subtle nuances and shades of a very specific color uh, this is not something again that could be uh, arrived at through random trial and error uh, from a, a process devoid of any intelligence it takes skill and intelligence to compose sophisticated patterns that duplicate the results of light and shadow on textured organic surfaces chameleons are absolutely stunning creatures that can at will uh, you know change the the surface pattern of their bodies to match into the surrounding environments where it finds itself to camouflage itself uh, more efficiently this is a remarkable skill set that simply could not have have developed randomly over time uh, because when we look into the microscopic scale of what's happening uh, there's such a sophistication such a complexity going on that allows these creatures the ability to to manipulate their uh, their skin surfaces in such a way it just defies uh, defies the reasoning behind something being random and without uh, without any purpose no to do these kinds of things it, it takes an artist to do these things with such precision uh, especially animals here uh, like the willow ptarmigan who goes through a, a significant change in its uh, in its feather coloring so that it is camouflaged both uh, in the the light brown colors in the summer months to this beautiful clean white color in the winter months uh, so that this happens uh, seasonally to protect the animal this is a remarkable example again 
uh, of design. But then we have examples like this, the spice bush, swallowtail, and, and other similar mimicking animals that they're actually designed in such a way to mimic predators. And this becomes really fascinating because the design then takes on a psychological element and that the copycat design has to be so convincing that it's going to actually elicit uh, a fight or flight response in the minds of the would-be attackers as a bird swoops down to eat this moth and then comes face to face with what appears to be a snake that is going to be very, uh, an, uh, it's a deceptive enough design that it actually uh, would cause the bird to uh, to reject this meal Th that's pretty fascinating here's another example um, and this other uh, caterpillar that has a snake-like appearance and it actually has a defense mechanism that when it is uh, agitated it has these inflatable antenna that it will repel out that resemble the forked tongue of a snake this is stunning there's no way you can logically imagine that it could develop a defense mechanism that just happens to resemble uh, the tongue of a snake without any purpose uh, behind that no these kinds of animals are clearly designed from an intelligence and that intelligence is uh, Yahweh the God of the Bible look it's like this the accomplishment of these designs becomes even more stunning when we do think back to what's going on in these cellular machines from a biological standpoint we have to remember that in order to create uh, these kinds of colors and patterns and, and sophisticated uh, camouflage requires billions of chemical and genetic sequences to be executed perfectly on a microscopic scale and keep keep in mind too that we've never seen mutations that have uh, resulted in the formation of new information so when we put the two definitions of design together both from a biological sort of engineering standpoint and from an aesthetic artistic standpoint we create very very compelling evidence for the existence of a creator god and this is recognizable by anyone. Here's a great uh, example of this for uh, the frogfish. Found a quote online that said, The unusual appearance of the frogfish is designed to conceal it from predators and sometimes to mimic a potential meal to its prey. Interestingly enough, this quote came from why evolution is true uh, dot com. So even evolutionary advocates have to acknowledge the clear and present design that is in all nature. They like to say the appearance of design, but that's just a nice euphemism to try and dodge the contradictory logic in their theory. Now I want to share a video quickly that maybe you've seen online or not, but this is the video that kind of compelled me to want to put together this whole topic. And it is of an octopus and the extraordinary ability octopus have to camouflage themselves at will. Uh, and this uh, diver happened upon this octopus, look at that, and it swims away spooked, leaving the cloud of ink behind. Uh, and then almost immediately uh, finds a new environment and then starts uh, instantly trying to camouflage itself in this new environment. Now it's going to play the video back in slow motion uh, so you can see what is happening here and notice how it is changing the texture of its skin, it's changing the color of its skin, and it is merging itself, it is camouflaging itself perfectly into the 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 coral seaweed structure that it finds under there look at that in a matter of seconds it was able to elicit that kind of change it is a staggering amount of complex engineering going on in the scale of nanometers remember that allows things like this to happen uh, clearly these kinds of things don't just happen Clearly, these animals speak volumes about the wisdom, power, and creativity of our God 